Hello everyone out there in Facebook land. Thank you for joining us today. This is the fourth video that I have done with uh, in conversation with Janice Boyton. And, um, you know, we were talking about this right before we went live, is that we really haven't covered a lot. <laughs> Even though we've done two, four, six, almost eight hours of, of conversation we had on last week, we had um, a conversation with Catherine Beals. Catherine Beals. Thank you. I wanted to say Joanna Beals, but that didn't make sense. So Catherine Beals, and we talked about language and how people how people actually develop language. And it isn't as easy as just watching, uh, seeing a book laying around or listening to uh, a radio station to acquire the ability to be able to read and write and the concept of, of, of language and so on. So that was really interesting. You'll find there's a playlist on our YouTube channel, which is called About Time Project, and uh, that has, this will be the fourth video in that series. And Janice and I really haven't even talked about RPM, Rapid Prompting Method at all. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, eye gazing a little bit. I think that's what we're going to be talking about a lot, aren't we? Yes. Gazing, yeah. So Janice, give us your like 30 seconds of who you are real quick while I drink my cup of tea out of my one short, one cat short of crazy mug that Paula got me for Christmas. <laughs> well, um, right now I'm an artist from Maine, but um, back in the day I was a speech language clinician and I came, became involved in um, facilitated communication in the early 90s. Um, it, reached the United States in around 1990 um, and it reached my school system around you know a year or two later um, and so it was it was a facilitated communication for those who haven't seen the the previous videos is a um, communication technique that's used with um, people with severe communication difficulties so the the premise is that you provide them with uh, physical and emotional support and you help them type out messages on a on a letter board and that physical and and um, emotional support is supposed to unlock this knowledge that's inside them now um, FC was debunked pretty much in the mid 1994 95 um, when they did when people started doing double blind testing and so when when the facilitator didn't know the answers and, and the, the, the studies were controlled, um, what happened was um, they'd maybe show two pictures, one was the same, one was different, and, uh, or whatever, they'd vary, they'd vary those um, scenarios. And um, all the answers were based on what the facilitators saw in the, in the testing. And so what, what, um, many there have been many studies since then that repl replicate that if it if it, if the situation is controlled if the if the facilitator doesn't have answers ahead of time then it's always the facilitator responses that are recorded and not the person with disabilities so it's quite clear that fc is facilitator controlled um, and, and today the reason why we're talking today is um, it's sort of split off into um, two main groups. One is facilitated communication, which was, which is a person holding the facilitator holding the wrist of the, the person who's um, being facilitated or elbow or shoulder, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another kind called rapid prompting method where the facilitator actually holds up a letter board and the, the person with disabilities will point to the, to the letter and spell out words. And then there's a third kind that and we talked about rapid prompting method i think um two times ago maybe i don't know i don't think we went into depth yeah um and um uh the, the third kind i forgot where i was there for a second eye -gazing? um uh is eye gazing right and so there's a hybrid now where um, there's actually equipment that allows people with disabilities to um, wear an eye gazing technique and actually type directly onto a, onto a computer. So they, there's a signal that's sent to the letter that they want and it type, the computer types it out all by themselves. They don't actually have to have a facilitator, but the eye gazing um, that proponents are using involves rapid prompting method generally and 
eye gazing techniques. So um, we're going to talk a, a little bit about that and show some videos. So yeah. it's sort of there's, there's three aspects. That's why we were saying, you know, like you think you're just scratching the surface, and then there's, there's all this um, these side avenues that you could go when talking right. about the subject. We so. hear from people all the time saying, "I can't believe this is still around." I was looking at Skeptical Inquirer had had put up your video of the interview you did with Brian Kirby, the 502 uh, conversations. I was just looking at that yesterday <clears throat> and, or this morning and they, <clears throat> in the comments, people were saying, what, this is still around facilitated yeah. communication. And I think if anything, what you and I are trying to hammer home is yes, it is still around. Um, and two, yes, this is a very harmful, this can be very harmful in many ways. And we're trying to make that clear. And this conversations of videos we're having, I, I think we're one of the, this is probably the only kind of long running discussion of it. I mean, there's articles that people can read. There's some videos that people can watch. But as far as a conversation between people who, who are interested in this subject and, and gosh, somebody like you who's actually been there and done that um, and has a t-shirt, <laughs> somebody who's gone through this, <clears throat> there's so much information. This isn't just a one shot. We plan on doing several videos because there's going to be so much, you guys, that is out there you're not going to believe. And <clears throat> I, I, I'm just appalled. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention right off, because this was really interesting today, I got this email sent to me from Center for Inquiry who had forwarded it to me. And it was from Paul Hidalgo, who's the communications director over there. And he said, Susan, I think this is your, uh, your email. <laughs> I'm going to read this to you for a second because this will make sense in a, in a minute. Okay. It's very short. Greetings, Susan. A friend of mine shared one of your articles with me. I am wondering, are you fully convinced that there are no true psychics? Or would you like to talk to and have a free reading with a true and genuine psychic? I'm also a skeptic. I Perhaps I am one of the very few skeptic, psychic skeptics in the world. I look forward to hearing from you. She gave me her, her email and her phone number, like people call each other anymore. I guess I could text her and uh, her email. <clears throat> so my response to her was, yeah, let's do it. I'd never heard of her before. Her name is, and I'm going to butcher this, it's, Sincerey, S-I-N-C-E-A-R-A-Y, Sincerey, I guess, just one word, and I took a look at her website, and I said, sure, as long as I could record it and share it, uh, a reading, I, you know, heck, why not, so I suggested uh, her a time this upcoming Friday at 11 o'clock my time, which would be about the same time now, so I'm waiting to get an email back from her, but here's what, here's where it hits with Janice and I, <clears throat> and I went to her website. Let me, let me show you this real quick. You guys, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate this. So let me share, share this screen with you. Janice doesn't know where I'm going with this either. So <laughs> it's all a mystery. Here we go. You can see this is her, this is her and her website. There she is. See, how, how would you pronounce that? Seeing your future today. Sincere? 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 I don't know. Sense array, yeah, I guess S I N C E, sense array, sense array, yeah, sense array, that makes sense. I think she wants you to, to know that she's sincere. Yeah, she's a compassionate, intuitive medium and clairvoyant with extraordinary abilities. Mm -hmm. So I went over to her personal page, and as I'm looking at this, I'm going, okay, here's your personal journey, appearances, and parties, pet readings. Uh, she does mediums, mediumship, which means that she can speak to the dead. And this little paragraph is what caught my eye. Giving a voice, for those who can't read this, since Sense, Sensei is a voice for those who are unable to express for themselves. She can communicate through their energy and tell you their feelings, concerns, and any issues they may have. Sensei has worked with infants, babies in, in intro, what is it called? In, in the body and still inside the baby in the body. People with autism, cognitive disabilities, and coma patients helping people to express themselves and share their thoughts and interests, providing you with a better understanding and closeness. Wow. <laughs> well, I thought of you immediately and I thought, oh, so. She's doing facilitated communication, basically. Yeah, so she's just, you know, people in comas, really? 
And yeah. that's thing that happened before. And I think there's been other cases of people doing facilitated communication or something mm -hmm. with a with a person in a coma saying that, you know, it's the same idea. They're locked in. They're mm -hmm. they're thinking clearly. They just need some way of communicating outside to the outside world. And that's possible if there is cognitive um, consciousness. I don't even know what you'd call it. I mean, people in comas sometimes have cognitive abilities, but the ability to want to communicate is or the ability to communicate. There may be there may be something that's preventing them from from yeah. Communicating. So so there was a, there's a case called Rom Hoven. It's R O M H O U B E N. And what they did was they put a they put a pointer on his head, and the 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 um, facilitator held the board, and they and supposedly he was able to point to the letters with his head, but he was in a coma. <clears throat> So basically, what they found out was she was she was moving it around. Is the eyes open? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't. I don't know a whole lot about it. I think so. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't. They've actually facilitated with people who are blind. So I don't know. You know. There's a on Prisoners of Silence. I believe also Rosemary Crosley um, had had somebody with a pointer on their head, and she was also holding the board. And what they did was they they drew a a box on the screen, and they and and they could to, just to visualize um, that she was actually moving the the board was actually moving and not the person with with the pointer on his head. So, yeah, that's frightening to me. Um, How would that even work? That a person who is blind is able to point to letters on a keyboard. Yeah, I don't how, know. How would they? How could you? <laughs> How do you wrap your brain? I mean, I understand these people get into this slowly. They don't necessarily just jump in saying, hey, I'm communicating with somebody who's never communicated it before, has never had any instruction in reading and writing, has never said anything other than maybe just, uh, what do you call it? The, what is that you called it? Gosh, I can't think it's the word when you repeat something. Echo, echo, oh, echo lady. Yeah, I've okay. never heard of that before. Yeah. That was really interesting. And yeah. and how how would you say the person is blind? Here's a letter board. Point to some letters on it for me, and we'll. S yeah, I don't know. They, I don't know. They, with the facilitator's support, they were able to type out letters. So. I'm sure the person explained with the typing out how it was they were able to communicate without being able to see. Uh, yeah, I don't. It's uh, I. It, I really need to go back and find the study again. It, it, that was a long time ago. That was in the early days. So maybe that, that was maybe a, a, a one or two of, and they, they kind of fell by the wayside. I don't know. Um, I should mention that I was a facilitator. Yeah, yeah. For, for people who don't know. And, well, and I know happened. what you're talking about. Yeah. And so I actually, you're not supposed to test it, facilitated communication, because it's taken as an affront to the person with disabilities to, to question. The, the communication so you know there's no double blind testing in place in any of it in in facilitated communication rapid prompting method or this eye gazing there's there's no there's no actual blinded testing done um in my case um and and we we've sort of touched on some of the harms there was um abuse allegations that came out when i was using facilitated communication and and there was another facilitator involved as well so um it 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 came in and i don't know how much we want to get into that today we will at some point but um it came to a point where we needed to t we needed to find out who was doing the communicating and kicking and screaming me <laughs> i went <laughs> um if it was the right thing to do you know i i was sort of in between a rock and a hard place you know do you do you go against your training and and test it or do you um you know or what do you do with these people who are are in a really their the family was was in danger of of the father was in danger of being jailed the kids had already been removed from their home you know what do you do so the right thing to do was to do the double blind testing and so because i went through that experience i realized oh yeah it really was it really was me and it's a lot more complicated than that and a lot more emotional than that but that's basically for the sake of this conversation that's the gist of it it's like um i experienced what they that what people were 
finding in the double blind testing. Um, so the science kind of backed up my experience and not the other way around. So anyway, I just, um, the, I also wanted to touch on um, the, the, in the email, she said she was a skeptic, which was kind of interesting because if you talk to proponents, they'll also say that they were skeptical at first. And so that term means different things to different people. And I think that, that we should emphasize that for the most part, people who get involved with facilitated communication, and I'm gonna use that term for all of the forms, because mm -hmm. they're all basically the same, um, really are, are looking, sincerely and honestly looking for a way to reach the, the person that they're, they're working with, the person with disabilities. And so it's a, um, you, you can trick, your brain can t trick you kind of into, because you want it so badly, you can, you can, you can fall into the trap of thinking that it really works without, and, and you can think you're being skeptical, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, at first I doubted it. That's what a lot of the stories will say, you know, of, of the proponents will say, oh yeah, at first I doubted it, but I tried it and, and it worked, or, or I saw it working with my loved one. And it was really true, you know, I really believed it. So there's a, we should emphasize that, uh, except for the leadership who I think should know better and they should, they should take on board the scientific testing, the rank and file facilitators really sincerely do believe that they're doing the right thing Absolutely. for their, for their child, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's the, so when Janice and I are talking about this for the, for the average person who's using facilitated communication, a parent or a facilitator, they are genuinely thinking they're helping their client they're, They really do think they're helping. Uh, this is what they were taught. Why should they question it? They genuinely feel that they're, they're probably very compassionate people who are doing a job. This is what they were told to do. This is the training they had. But in my day, 2021, I mean, 2020 and, and in the last few years, personally, I, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not going to give them that much of a pass because when you have, um, when you're given some kind of procedure to do or something of the sort, and it is just like a miracle like this. I mean, if you're an adult, a thinking adult, I think that you should do your due diligence and do a little research. And if you find the name facilitated communication, rapid prompting method, hand over hand, spelling to communicate, or any of these names, a quick Google will lead you right smack dab to the Wikipedia page with every detail on it, with the harm, with citations, with experts, how it has been absolutely unendorsed by multiple um, autism and pediatric kind of, uh, you know, organizations. I, I don't see how a person today in the last few years could use this technique and not think this is silly. This is crazy. I can't believe this is, this is happening. Let me do a quick Google search and find that and then not realize what they're doing. And they may be doing that. We just don't hear from those people, but you know, no. I think they Google and they find what they want to find. So but they're- the Wikipedia they're is coming up first. You've got to do a quick read through yeah. the Wikipedia page. I mean, if even just right. the first paragraph. We got the big old, this is pseudoscience, <laughs> big old, like, like, you know, three inches long right there on the Wikipedia page at the top. So you cannot miss it. This is not real science. How do you not see that? But so- if you're being told by universities and like the state of Vermont, the government website and, you know, other places that, that um, it works and it, it's the, you know, they, they, they'll say it's the, it's the technique of last resort. So if you've gone, this is their marketing pitch. If you've gone through um, ABA um, behavior analysis and other um, evidence-based programs and methods and it's not working for you we can solve that problem like rapid prompting method the there was an article that just came out um, recently and the 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 um leader of the rapid prompting method said that her success rate is a hundred percent i bet and there's no tech but but no she tech. also how do you know that if you no can't there's zero testing. They, there was also just a systematic review that 
that came up. There's there was one for facilitated communication and then a separate one for rapid prompting method. And FC, there's no there's no evidence. That's 30 years worth of um, evidence that there, there's no evidence that it's independent communication and rapid prompting method. They refute the people who are using rapid prompting method refuse to do any tests. So their position is it works because we are, we're using it and it works. And the scientific community is saying there's no proof that it works because you haven't, you know, um, subjected this to double blind controls. Um, and so the FC community also reads that as, as well, see, there's no, there's no negative studies against this, so it, it works. So that's their, it's a circular reasoning. They're only looking at what they want to see. Yeah, you're kinder than I am, I think, uh, towards yeah. the, the modern facilitators who I, I think should- I think it's okay. crazy. I think, it, I think it's, I think it's, the, the other thing, the other thing that I don't understand, I do not understand this. There are national organizations, American Speech Language Hearing Association, American Psychological Association, blah, 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 20, there's 20, over 20 across, around the world major organizations who have looked into facilitated communication and those organizations say we oppose this it, there's no evidence that it works and we're we're, we're worried that um, facilitator influence and we're also worried about false allegations of abuse and other things that are going on with this so that's the national level but the state and and local organizations are are like there i mean there's a percentage that agree with that but there's another whole percentage that say well we're going to interpret the evidence differently i'd like to know what that means cuz you know it, there's no way that, there's no way to interpret it any other way except the facilitator is doing the communication right. and i'm sorry that's just the no, way it yeah, is yeah that's how i feel i'm so, sorry but no <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know how, I mean, I know that they aren't policing organizations, but why aren't there, why aren't there licensing controls in place that if you're using a, a discredited technique, then why isn't that, um, why doesn't that, why isn't there a fine or a harm to your license or whatever? I mean, if there is, I'd like to know about it. I haven't heard any about any. Um, My answer is if they don't think that it is a harm. I don't think they see the harm. I think they think it's, it, as you've said many times that you've heard, it's the option of last resort. They, these people have tried everything. They're desperate parents to communicate with their child. And anybody, and, and if you speak out against it, you are, you know, Satan, breed of Satan or something, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah. how dare you challenge, how dare you challenge this is works for my child and how dare you, you are anti disability and you're anti autism and you're right. I mean, so why would you want to speak out about it? Because the amount of harm is not seen. So, yeah. and in some cases, like you say, it's, it's at the last resort. So they've already tried some places have already tried conventional, um, conventional training you know, or already tried, tried that. Well, anyway, we need to get over, we'll just be, oh my gosh. Rant over. Yeah, well, not really, but um, let me, <laughs> let's, let's get to what we were going to talk to today because you guys out there watching, you know, so be prepared. What we're going to show you first is really intense. All right. And you may have seen this on um like morning programs those those good morning programs that and they see this as a success they see this as amazing they think this is um uh you know a good thing now janice and i have a really hard time watching this and i think you guys are going to do this too so i'm going to show you just about a minute of a video this is a can you set it up who's this who is this child? This is Jonathan Bryan, and he is um, his his mom and another facilitator are using a hybrid of rapid prompting method where um, the mom holds Jonathan and looks at a board that's uh, um, some distance away, and there's another facilitator who is um, pointing is watching the 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 um, 
the idea of this technique is that the the facilitator that's holding the board is watching the eyes of of the person being facilitated and pointing to the letters that he's gazing at and we'll we'll talk about some of the problems with that um once you've seen the video and how old is this child um it looks like I, he's five or six but he's a teenager I he's, right i think he's a teenager yep yeah. all right you guys so you've been warned if you have a, a you've just been warned okay this is this is this is hard to to watch it's not an, so. yeah it's not an easy warning. not an easy thing to watch okay so let me share the screen over here you guys real quick and share and let me make this large so you guys can see this hopefully it's not too choppy but you'll get the idea Okay, that's about as much as I can handle. <laughs> wow, that's hard to watch. I don't know about you guys out there. That is just intense to me. It's so hard. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that bothers me is that um, Jonathan is obviously in distress. He cannot breathe when his head is in that position. His mm -hmm. he um, actually like breathing really heavily. He's turning red. His his he's frothing at the mouth. I mean, he just cannot. That position is not comfortable for him at all. So that really particularly bothers me that that video. Right. Now let me read the description of this video. I'm hot. I just cannot. Oh my gosh. So the description, this is this one has been is put out by UK Aid. It's some British group, uh, Department for International Development. Um, and they say for the first nine years of his life, Jonathan's cerebral palsy meant he could not communicate with the outside world until his mom discovered he could communicate through a spelling board. He has now written a book with his eyes, which is available here, and they give you the link. And you can follow Jonathan's charity, Teach Us Too, which is receiving all his proceeds from the book. So, where do you want to start? <laughs> um let me go back well, over to facebook and see if anybody else is watching and is like appalled first of all the the requirement for that particular setup is that all three people involved need to have extraordinary eye tracking ability so um two of the people jonathan and his mom need to be able to track what's going on across the across i don't know how many feet away that that person what the other facilitator was and she has to in turn she needs to um she needs to keep track the facilitator holding the board needs to keep track of um jonathan and his he, supposedly she's able to see from that distance him moving his eyes and and what she's doing on the back of that board is she's she's pointing to the letters that supposedly he's looking at so that's quite a feat in and of itself to be able to do that. The second thing is, um, I um, I believe that Jonathan has Rett syndrome. I, I, if I'm wrong about that, then then um, it still applies to this technique. I I, I believe that's true. I, I, um, and what and is Rett syndrome? Rett syndrome. Uh, I'm not sure exactly all of the what the syndrome is. It's, it's a disability, um, but one of the symptoms of it is that um, people have difficulty eye tracking that's one of the they're, they're like physically they have trouble eye tracking so 
Um, so that just kind of emphasizes a point that the, the person that, that's using this particular technique really needs to actually have the physical capacity to, um, like if I was moving my finger, to watch that and, and to track it without, you know, um, any difficulty. And, and people with Rett syndrome, um, this, there was a, the, the reason why I know just about, just a little bit about Rett syndrome in this particular, because somebody sent me this eye tracking study that was done on people with Rett, Rett syndrome in particular. So, so that's one of the problems is that they can't track really quickly. And so she's holding the board and she's like, even this quick, you'd have to be able to, you'd have to be able to track that quickly to, to know and be able to, to judge that from across the room. Um, and, and so, and, and another thing about this um, particular setup is that the mom is holding um, Jonathan by the head and by the neck. So oh, I didn't realize that. She's, she's moving his neck and she's holding it up. So if you, if you actually watch her, watch the video again, watch her, you can, you can physically see her moving his neck. I, I'm going to show another 10 or 30 seconds of this in a minute, but um, because now that people understand, oh, finally somebody has actually commenting on the video that we just showed. Everybody else in the comments, you can't see Janice. We're talking about the weather, wherever they're at. Okay. Thank you, Klaus. <laughs> it's nice Arthur. here. <laughs> and Bob and Paula and all those talking about your weather. We're trying to discuss something serious over here. Rob finally saw, so is the only one who's commenting. He says it's appalling. He says, put a person without disabilities in that position who spells out with their eyes a prearranged sentence and see if the facilitators can spell it out. Yeah, even <laughs> simpler. That'd be simple. Even, even more simple than that is that there is there is eye gazing technology where the person with disability wears the, yeah there's a light and it that light sends a signal to directly to the keyboard and it types out exactly what letter <laughs> you're you're looking at so you don't need a facilitator yeah and why are they holding it in the air and why are they holding it? That's Just like with RPM. What the heck? You're holding a stupid piece of paper in the air. Why are you doing that? Why don't you put it on a board and stationary in front of them? A big board. I, you know, this time when I saw it, I was looking at the video and I could see some of the things on the um, on the board. And there's a like a caps. It says caps, like for capital letters. So you got this person sitting in his mom's lap. And he's going to capitalize. I mean, can't you just just assume? Why, why he's communicating? A miracle, amazing. Why does he have to have correct grammar? I mean, he even puts a full stop at the end. There's a period on that board, right? And a capital letter. Like like if my child was able to communicate for the first time in my life, I'm going to go like grammar police and say oh well you didn't put it you used a comma and not a period oh my gosh well yeah. the thing the miraculous right. thing about fc and rpm is that people people um come out with who who previously had little or no spoken ability and and little or no written language ability all of a sudden can type out they not only can they type out full sentences they they automatically know grammar and and the 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 rules of grammar as well so it's it's pretty amazing okay, so i'm going to show you just a little bit more now that you guys have a little more background on this it's like i said it's really difficult to watch um let me let me make this let me let me do this again i love this magic of, of zoom this is this is one wonderful to be able to do this to be able to show you i hope it's not too choppy you guys but um it's a little chop but is it it's a little choppy but it's okay okay well, in a way, like you said last time, one time we were watching this is that it's a little choppy and you can see more what, the, what they're doing. Okay, so now from this angle, you're going to be able to see his eyes. Now, watch how this works. Look at his eyes are crossed. 
Right. They're also not darting back and forth, which it would which you would expect if if yeah. you're bored. Mm -hmm. they're staying in one position. Yeah. There was a yeah. little movement. One eye is looking one place, one eye is looking another place. He badly does not want to be in the position he's in. And if you if you watch her look look at her face she's um, directly she's staring right at that board she can't see what what the child is looking at she's only she's only calling out what the person points to so mom's having a conversation with a facilitator holding her child struggling in her lap this the child doesn't even have to be there there's another angle let me see if i can find it again real quick it looks through the child's um hold on you guys i had this a minute ago what where did i say it was well i can't see it right now but there was they were looking through so you're looking directly through the uh letter board at the child this one right here see see here's the letter board oh they skipped it so uh <laughs> i'm really laughing because i'm frustrated and, and and like and rob palmer says commas are really important and yeah because that can change the whole structure of a sentence we all know that right but give him a break and um how do the facilitators not realize this is bogus janice how how is it that they can't see this is bogus because they don't look they don't test it they don't they they only it, it's the same with a, a psychic reading you only pay attention to the hits right so you've got these guidelines and you you start working with it and you um and you say for for facilitated communication one of the things they said to look for at first was um unique spellings which somebody pointed out to me that it was it was um interesting that that you know the truth of facilitated communication by the mistakes people were making but that's another whole story but okay so you're you're told to to look for unique spellings that's one way like because the facilitator would spell everything correctly right that's that's the that that's the thinking behind it and so yeah so you're you're moving the the person's hand or you're you're facilitating with the person and all of a sudden these spellings these unique spellings start coming out, you know, and, and you, and so you look at it and you're, you're also taught to look at the, um, to put more stake in the written word than in the spoken word. So, um, so you see this characteristic spelling, misspelling of the person, um, and <clears throat> you think oh okay so that's that's one thing that's one thing that's going right we're starting to see spellings that are unique to that particular individual and then another thing was to look for senses of humor and so all of a sudden the person's making jokes and you're like oh okay so that's you know and and you're supposed to listen for unexpected um um utterances not you know like typing sentences and so they say something kind of quirky or or weird or and you and you and you attribute it the facilitator attributes that to the person they're working with mm -hmm. and so over time by increments um you start convincing yourself that it's it's quote unquote working and you only look for those instances and you don't you you don't look for you stop you're not trained really to to not that you could actually but to to keep track of your own movements and your own thoughts there's just too much going on there's no way you could do that mm -hmm. really but that's what you but as soon as it starts working and it and it it kind of feels like um there's a flow that happens that when it starts quote unquote working and so you 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 relax into it and you and you um just stop looking at yourself you just you just always believe it's the other person you or you convince yourself that it's the other person mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you're driving <clears throat> down the road and you've driven like from home to work umpteen million times and you're every turn and every you know you're adjusting the steering wheel um all the time
but you don't really notice it. And in fact, you can get from home to work and say, oh, I'm already here. I, you know, like I sort of blanked out the last five minutes of my commute. And so that's kind of, that's, I don't know how else to explain it really, but that's kind of, that's that's kind of what happens in your head. Or if you're, if you're a writer or an artist, um, you might have experienced where um, you get into this flow where everything just seems to be going really easily. And, and two hours later, you know, you've got a painting or you've got um, a page of your, your essay done or whatever, and you don't really, there's no conscious thought of getting from A to B. You've just, you know, you've just reached that point. And I think that's kind of what your brain, what the facilitator's brain does. I think they sort of just kind of um, get into this motion, this, this, it, it becomes kind of a ritual where you can see a, a, a lot of the videos where people are using FC, or even, even the rapid prompting method, but to a, it's a, that's a little bit trickier to, to figure out than FC, but you'll see where the, the, the two people are kind of interact, interacting, maybe goofing around a little bit. And then the facilitator brings out the board and the, the person with the, that's being facilitated automatically puts their finger out, they're trained to do that. And so it's like, it's that ritual, uh, like I, I just thought of this just now, but it's sort of a ritualistic kind of um, behavior, trained behavior that happens. And it happens as much to the facilitator as it does to the person with disabilities. Let me read some of these comments really quick before, because um, I can see about the last five comments on, on Facebook. And so uh, let me read them before they disappear and I can't see them anymore. So Heather Henderson, who's at the park watching us right now, hopefully socially distancing with her mask on. <laughs> she says the parents are desperate, which is absolutely right. Yeah. Klaus Larson, who's watching us over in um, Copenhagen, I think that's where he's at. It's really nice to have a European audience. He says the ability of the kid to speak as his mom is equivalent to psychics channeling spirits from ancient Egypt and modern English, which is mm -hmm. about right. Rob Palmer says, I would almost buy it more if they thought this worked through some sort of magic. This boy is clearly in all caps, not looking at the letters <laughs> they are saying he is. Uh, and Klaus says, well, that's not entirely correct. The kid is looking at the letters all the time. The adults are simply trying to keep up with the speed reading wonder of a kid, and that must be it. Oh, and he's, oh, he told me he's not in Copenhagen. He's a northern jumble of letters that starts with an S place that ends in land. S-J-A-E-L-L-A-N-D is where he's actually at. So sorry, Klaus. I didn't, Heather said, uh, um, I wonder if the woman has no real connection to the son. Otherwise, how could she not feel he was suffering? And that's a really good point. Um, this is somebody she's worked in, uh, she's somebody she's worked with for a long time as her child. And this is like a, I hate to say it, like a dog and pony kind of show. They go on the morning TV all the time and the mom puts the child in her lap and holds them like that. The child is just obviously suffering. And the audience is like, oh, this is so amazing. Oh, I love it. Look what they've done. And the, and the host award. Show is, hmm? They've got awards. Oh, he gets awards. He writes books. He's like a star. And the mother is just like, let's go on the road with my kid and, and do all the morning shows. And everybody will give his heartfelt love of how amazing this is. This kid as you said you've seen him when they pull his neck back he's, he can't breathe he can't, he can't breathe. breathe he is definitely suffering through this he does not want to have i'm sure he does i mean it must be nice to feel like you're being cuddled by your mom all the time that may be so i don't know but no no it's, it's important to to know that the it FC and all these techniques are not about the person with disabilities. It's about the what what it gives to the facilitator. That's the that's the sad part about it. Um, there there may be some slight benefits to the person with disabilities, but mostly it's about what's happening with the the facilitator. And I actually think that going through the double blind testing gave me an awareness of my own thought processes. And I actually think that the person with disability, I mean, the, the facilitator has um, imagined, imagined an idealized version of the, their person with disabilities, whether it's their child or client or whatever. 
and that's where the conversation actually happens is between the facilitator and the 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 idealized version um in your head mm -hmm. um, paul says when he's reading in quotes he is strained but when they take a break and the mother hugs him then he's happy so you almost kind of think there's some reward going through this if i sit here and struggle and, and try not to struggle so much um and uh i will be rewarded afterwards with mm -hmm. you know i said that we were we were talking to Catherine. she Catherine Beals is a linguist and she's also special. She has a son with autism and has kind of focused a lot of her attention on developing language techniques for people with autism. And she said, how does it, how does that work? Because her son would never sit for that. And I think, that, I think that that reinforcement is exactly, um, it's a, it's a really powerful, um, reinforcement. And now that you say that, I, I think of another, there's other examples where I've seen where the the in between just exactly how you described in between the facilitation the the person with disabilities is touching touching the mom or you know like somehow connecting with the person the facilitator and so I think I think that is I think that's a really powerful they may not understand all of what's going on but they do get that reinforcement I think that's a really powerful insight yeah loving loving it uh, looks like he's being loved and I'm, I'm sure that is somebody also mentioned the, a magical component now there's a there's a um there's a whole side of facilitated communication that some of the even some of the leadership don't like to talk about but um in the early 90s james randy was um called in to look at some people who were facilitating and i think i'd have to go back and double check but so don't quote me on this but i think it was um university uh madison wisconsin i think that's i think that's, that's mm -hmm. and um and so they they wanted him they um to check whether the students were psychic so that's that's why he was hired to and so he went in and he observed them and they he realized really quickly they were using facilitated communication their language skills were much much higher than what their age you know even for a, a typically developing child like a, a, a sixth grader a, um, a six-year-old with a you know like a college vocabulary kind of thing and so he said he said to the people organizing this thing well before we test what to see whether they're psychic or not maybe we should test the the communication first and they and they essentially fired him they were like no we're not going to do that they never called him back Isn't this what uh, ray hyman says before you decide before you start looking into it you uh, the hyman imperative i think it's called make sure there's a there there make sure there's something there before you try to get into the to it heather heather has Heather's been around for a long time in, in this world with me with um, busting psychics and stuff. In fact, I hope Heather is going to give us a lecture herself, a talk herself. We want to talk about Operation Ice Cream Cone, Heather. Um, she wants to know if we're going to try to catch somebody in the act doing this. And I, first thing in my mind is it, they're putting out these videos as if yeah. this is good. The, they've decided I'm going to record this. They looked at the footage afterwards and said, boy, this is great footage. Let's put it up on the internet. And one of the first things we did, um, uh, the first time we, we, was it the first video talk we had, we talked about how, um, they went around the room and the parents were all facilitating around the room. And I said, they think this is the best. They think this is great this is the youtube channel i took it off of is their youtube channel so we don't have to sting them they yeah. already know i mean they did it it's uh <laughs> saved by typing. that was the group it was called exactly. saved by typing if you google google that saved by typing yeah and it's also one of our our um previous versions deborah has written and says thank you for aligning yourself with evidence they still fail to explain the magical and quote again acquisition of literacy skills and we talked about this on with Catherine beale's last uh, video mm -hmm. about how they magically um uh, acquire these skills far above their their ability and age or education can you give like a quick breakdown of what it is they say yeah so the the they're convinced that people um 
gain language written written and spoken language skills simply by um, seeing it in being exposed to it in the environment. So they may be listening on the radio or there may be magazines that are around in the room that they're in, or um, they may catch a little bit on TV or whatever, but it's, it's um, the, the, the argument is, is that they learn it through the environment and, and they don't need to be taught because they locked in and they already know they already know this and, and that Catholics, so smart. right but the the problem with that is that um spoken both spoken and written language have symbolism that goes along with it um and in particular to whatever language you're speaking so we don't we don't think in english or you know like you have to be taught those structures you have to be taught these skills higher math skills um there there are people that uh, um and you're not talking about um, just like adding four plus four. You're doing like algebraic equations within two or three times of, of right. using facilitated communication. So there, they continue to say that um, autism is simply a motor difficulty, which hasn't been proven. And um, in fact, a lot of the, the people that we see, they can, they can paint, they can hold a spoon and they can feed themselves. They can actually point and touch, touch um, communication devices on their own. So that kind of blows their theory about a motor planning problem. But, but they've absorbed all this information and simply by giving this emotional and, and um, physical support, they're able to produce this language it, and it doesn't make sense you know like oh it doesn't well klaus has has a really interesting comment he says fc should actually be used in schools because clearly the kids achieve academic superpowers in night no time flat <laughs> and uh klaus uh, says as a non-english speaker i can testify that english is a really weird language to learn and i mean really really weird and yeah you think about it, these kids are picking up on on just the nuances of English that, that, I mean, you know, my kids and myself had to go through years of instruction on understanding the English language throughout, you know, kindergarten to whatever grade. And these kids seem to be fine with picking up on the nuances of puns. I mean, that's, that's really a hard concept, puns and- Well, and see, the, the humor- other the humor is kind of important because to prove their point, because a lot of these parents also believe that not only are, are you locked in, but you're intellectually above average. And so the humor is, is a, quite an important piece because it takes a certain understanding of language to um, express humor uh, and, diff and also express different kinds of humor. So I think that's, I think that's part of the whole package you know that's 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 what the parents are looking the i think people that are promoting this and 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 using it are really looking for that conversation they're not they they want i love mom i want i love dad but they really would like to have those engaging conversations and and that's part of that's part of the myth the right. mythology of of fc do you remember there was a and i'm not even sure the parents knew that their child would you know they 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 enlist their parents enlist their children into the school system and the school system might say oh we're going to try this technique we're going to do this thing they don't really explain to them some some students come to the school with uh facilitated communication already part of their curriculum but some they're like let's try this with them and the parents aren't even really understanding what it is i mean right. well, they you know, call it, if it works they, they call it something else they right. call, call it something it. else yeah, yeah. They, you, we're just assisting their communication so that right. sounds all right doesn't it yeah and so we're, we're going to support them in their they're not going to call it they don't necessarily call it supported typing even though that's another name for facilitated communication uh -huh. they we're going to support their communication well that sounds okay doesn't it and they change the name often so that yeah. you know so that nobody can really google it and find it necessarily but we've kind of figured that out and we've changed the wikipedia entries to make sure that they reflect that every time it changes its name to something else you google that you'll get the facilitated communication wikipedia page each time uh, so we're, we're up on that 
but um, I'm thinking of this one time the child came to the school and they tried this technique with him. And I guess he was Hispanic, you know, brown skinned child. And one facilitator taught him in Spanish and she facilitated, he, he was able to communicate back with her in Spanish. And cause she spoke Spanish. And I guess the facilitator assumed he spoke Spanish in the household. But then the parents were like, wait a minute, nobody in our household speaks Spanish. So where did he pick up Spanish? Because sometimes he's speaking in English when the, when the facilitator is an English speaker, and sometimes he's speaking in Spanish. And it is only whenever he's, I mean, in theory, if you are, if you're speaking in, a, in Swedish, and that's the only language that's taught in your household, and well, maybe not Swedish isn't a good, because they have umlauts and all these other little things, but like, um, you know, if you're speaking in Spanish and the only language that's taught in your household is Spanish and your child is facilitating in English, mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense because he's not picking it up unless they say he's been watching TV or something, I guess. I don't know. But he should be able to facilitate in Spanish with a, with a, a facilitator who doesn't speak Spanish. So, yeah. Maybe just be that typing would, it out, whatever he says. Great. That That's an easy way of testing. Just put somebody in who does not know the language that the child facilitates under and see if they. It's really the, when I when I went to the training, I, di I didn't have the critical thinking skills, obviously, to to avoid getting into using facilitated communication. But my my the the training really is pretty heavy on on not testing it and pretty heavy on um the skepticism you know if, if you're skeptical then you're against people with disabilities but also they the, it's like ooh, scientific testing we can't do that well you know and and what happened was for me in my situation and i remember being out really there janice really scared about that you know and so the person sat beside me in a in the classroom that's that both of us for, were familiar with and the the person that was doing the double blind testing had this folder and and um it had like flaps in it so he'd show me a picture and then he'd show her a picture and he'd he'd move the flap down if the picture was going to be different or whatever it's very simple no stress on on her whatsoever it was the stress was all on me you know because the the attention was on the facilitator obviously and and even even I, I say that they were very respectful. That's the other thing. They they'll they'll say, oh, these these people who are testing, you know, they're out to get you, and they're they're you know they're, there's this paranoia that sort of surrounds whether you're doing the double blind testing or not. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't find that was the other thing that there was another piece of the puzzle that sort of broke things apart for me afterwards. I'm like, that wasn't my experience at all my experience was that the person that was testing was very respectful of both me and the person i was working with they gave her i didn't know this until afterwards but they gave her a way out to stop the testing anytime she wanted to so there was no pressure on her whatsoever to even stay she could have left after the first 10 minutes um or you know whatever anytime she wanted to she had a secret code all she had to do was was i think they put something on the shelf there's a cup on the shelf go pick up the cup and you can leave you oh, know that will be your signal that you don't want to do this anymore she oh interesting i hadn't heard they've that. done that they've done that with other test participants and they they're like giving high fives to everybody and participating and the only time that that and the facilitators will report afterwards well, yeah, we were facilitating exactly like we expected, and then they get the test results, and it's it's facilitated influence. Oh, then the test was you know they they were out to get us, and they go into that kind of you know one this one documented case where the there was a um, false allegation of abuse, and they they blinded the facilitator, and they did this testing, and it, and she was like, well, it's easier if I know what the answers are. It's easier to facilitate. No and it's like, 
but she was sincere. That's the sad part about it was that she was sincere. And it's like, yes, it is. It is much easier when you know what they And that's what a psychic, same thing with psychics, the same thing. It's yeah. much easier if I know you really well. It's much easier if you give me feedback as I'm giving you a reading. If you yeah. nod and agree and kind of help me out with some of it, it'll be much easier. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's how, why. yeah, that's how the training starts. You, you start with things that the facilitator already knows. You know, like fill in the blank or or multiple choice or point to a picture and spell out the word. And it's all, it's all based on what the facilitator knows ahead of time. And then there's never a point the the um, there's a court, there was a court case and, and one of the leaders in the, in this movement said um, in court that um, I, I think the range was 20 to 40% that he admitted in court, that 20 to 40 percent of the the communications were facilitator authored and it's like okay so if that's true which which 60 to 80 percent are we supposed to believe which ones because i don't know i don't know what the difference is and, and what child is not tested i mean you're in a school system How, aren't you, and if you're just a regular student like anybody else in the class except you have a facilitator sitting next to you you have to be tested for I mean, you're doing higher math. You're doing all these other things. Of course, yeah, you're tested. Why, oh, it's stressful for anybody to be tested. Yeah. You know, <laughs> tell me how many kids out there are going, oh, yeah, I can't wait. We have a test today. This is going to be great. <laughs> I'm so prepared. They can go to college. They can, they can present at the United Nations. These are true stories. You know, and they can, they can, um, produce false claims against their parents about sexual assault. So how, how come that's more stressful than sitting and, and, and answering questions like um, that the facilitator wouldn't know, like what's uncle so-and-so's, the color of uncle so-and-so's band? You know, what's your, what's your favorite stuffed toy that when you go home and you always pick up that stuffed toy when you get home, what's that? And what's the name of that stuffed toy? How is that more stressful? Because I don't know. So Rob has mentioned DJ, but we should, we, we, we are, we're going to, we're going to talk about that, like in a whole conversation by itself. Yeah. It's um, so much so we, we can explain who he is. DJ is, is a fairly well-known um, person in the, in the FC community. And um, he learned FC at the university of Northern Iowa and um, has used it ever since that was in the, in the fourth grade. And there's actually a movie out that features DJ graduating from high school and going to Oberlin College where he ended up, the, the, the film doesn't um, go that far, but he ended up um, graduating with two, two degrees from Oberlin College and um, he uses very clearly um, facilitated communication and I also think a bit of rapid prompting method. Uh, there's and so there's a there's a movie that's that's gotten awards and and is is um, is kind of circulating through the college campuses at the moment and we're going to talk about that whole thing. In so detail. Well, if you want to look it up, it's spelled D E E J, not D J. It's D E E J. That's the name. You can watch the trailer. The 18 seconds in the trailer, he's using facilitated communication. So. Very, very interesting. So I'm going to show another video. All right. This one's a few minutes longer. And this is um, Lindsay Pollock, Peter Rowe, and Terry Delaney. And this is... Um, they're from Australia. <laughs> yeah. These are the Australians. This is recorded in 2009. And this is a couple minutes long, I think. Yeah, two minutes, 38 seconds long. So um, I'm going to set this up and then we'll, we'll talk about it on the other side, as they say on the news. Let me, let me share the screen for this again. And let me make this large. There you go. <laughs> Hi. We're Crazy and I'm 
Peter Road and we are using facilitated communication book view. QWERTY is all about risk taking, breaking down walls, and looking at the nature of improvisation. Yes, folks, we have no idea what we are doing or Look at that. going to do when we step on a stage. Unbelievable, unbelievable people. I hope you're watching this. Hearing, reads, my and then turns those letters into words and then turns those words into song. The delicious music of the magic maestro Mr. Lindsay Wallach. That just freaks me out. It just, it's like a, oh, I don't, I don't, I, <laughs> oh my God. It's like a, it's like a skit, a vaudeville skit or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's known, I, I believe he's known as an autism advocate. And they are, they actually are in a theater group. So I don't know if that plays into it a little bit, but um, you can tell. <laughs> that Heather goes, what the fuck was that? <laughs> and Klaus says, I have to use all 12 fingers when I type. <laughs> Wait, I have to use all 12 fingers and an incredibly agile tail. And Deborah says, Deborah says, appalling. Yeah, I can't see if there's any other quote uh, comments before that. I can't see if you guys have just fallen. I just like all of them. Yeah, no, he never looks at the board. As soon as she lifts the board, they're tickling him at the beginning, which I think also is really weird. He's an adult, and ew. And um, <laughs> I'm sure he says that he loves being tickled. Yeah, if you ask him, he will type that yeah. he loves being tickled. He's pounding that board. Well, as soon as what's what was crazy to me when I saw that the first time was how quickly, as soon as she brought that board up, how he just put his, he was right, ready to go. So he, they trained him to point. In fact, in, in my case also, um, the, the speech language pathologist that was working with um, my client afterwards said every time she got out certain materials that I had used, um, using facilitated communication, she would she would put out her finger to point. So I taught her to point. So we have to be really, really careful about what we're actually teaching people. Um, part of the reason why I talk about this and, and my story is that I just think we need to really get hit hammer some of these things home. Um, he's pounding that board so hard and so quickly. I have no idea like how you could physically register what he's actually pointing to and whatever she's saying clearly is not going it's not it's even like at the same association <laughs> you know or like a psychic uh, a psychic uh, you know just um, just to be in the zone and just like oh man here's what is going on and 
it's like clearly like what like i like the yeah licorice time you guys this is how i'm coping i have chocolate popcorn and licorice red licorice because i am we're going through this COVID thing and I don't drink. So I have to have some licorice or something because. Yeah, mine's chocolate. Chocolate. I've got chocolate here too, Junior Mints. It, it, oh man. So the, the, <laughs> the other thing is that you're Make supposed to, if you're trained, supposedly you're trained in facilitated communication and the facilitators are supposed to help each other redirect and make sure that they're doing the technique correctly there was a person standing there the whole time watching that facilitator totally mess it up and um from a technique kind of standpoint <laughs> no no redirection and you'll find that in the other videos as well in the support it uh, saved by typing mm -hmm. there's a whole table of people using facilitated communication they are the only time i noticed we noticed anybody was actually redirected is when they pointed to the t when the individual with disabilities they went like this at one point and said look you know kind of like that yeah but there's right? also yeah and the well you're that's actually maybe what you're supposed to do um but there's a there's a, another time I was thinking of as well that the person um, interacted with the keyboard on their own without and the facilitator actually grabbed their hand and pulled it away so that so there's no teaching that you can you can and should be interacting with the keyboard all by yourself but it, that was evidence that they didn't really they just know they were supposed to touch that keyboard somehow they didn't there was no connection with what's being typed or the words or the reason why you'd even have a keyboard. Um, there's no proof of that whatsoever. Absolutely so. incredible. And um, going back to what Heather asked me before, are we going to do a sting and reveal this? And, you know, as I say, I don't have to, they put this out. They thought this was good. The guy is clearly not looking anywhere near the keyboard part of the time. She's focused intently on it, saying whatever she's free associating to say, yeah. And he's just going like this, and he's like, wow, look, there's a bird over there. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. <clears throat> they, yeah, I know. They think this is good. They think this is they great. Do. I don't have to sting somebody like this. This is beyond the video we're doing right now is the sting. We're, we're <laughs> you and I are talking about it. And the Wikipedia pages that show this over and over, and the lecture you gave at PsychCon and how you continually talk out. Uh, speak out. You you've spoken out to a um, uh, co couple college classes, right? Yeah, yeah. The what what really needs to be done is we need to somehow like um, the there are University of Syracuse is ground zero in the United States, and if we're just talking about the United States, there's also really strong. Um, Rosemary Crosley has a. Um, a her own organization in Australia. So those are the two main places. Uh, yeah. And they, they train people and they have what they call master trainers, um, including, which, which I'm kind of curious about is there's, there are at least two people in Vermont who with disabilities that use facilitated communication that are supposedly master trainers. Like how are they training other people to use facilitated communication when they can only communicate through facilitated communication. I'm I'm kind of curious about that, but if you if you um, if you look there, the master trainers are in pockets all over the United States and um, California, Colorado, um, University of Northern Iowa. I know that one because we we actually did some protesting there, um, letter writing campaign, um, Vermont, New York. And so we really need to find a way to push back against the administrations in these organizations. That really actually would be what would be more helpful. Right. I mean, we do these videos because people don't really know what we're talking about when we say FC. And it's a good way to train people to look at the facilitators because there's so many different names for FC. Now, supported typing, rapid prompting methods, spelling to communicate, you know you have to actually start looking at the interaction of the the facilitator and how how much they really control the the um conversation 
And so what would really be helpful is to get to these places, these organizations that continue to promote it despite all the, the scientific research. So always looking for ideas. We've written letter after letter to um, Syracuse, they don't care. We've had you know, some limited they, success. We, we, we wrote- Media attention. Yeah, we wrote we wrote to um, people in Vermont, and they ended. Essentially, what they did is they closed ranks. Even though behind the scenes, there were we had people saying, "Oh yeah, we agree with you." People who could have actually made it, maybe made a difference, um, but publicly they're like, "We're not gonna we're not gonna bow to pressure from an outside agency." Mm -hmm. And so we really need to find people in these organizations and and with the clout to. Um, stop stop this you know so here's here's the comments they're starting to come in now now that they've stopped talking about the flavor of licorice i'm having um <laughs> <laughs> just regular red licorice red licorice is good red, i don't like black or black licorice. Licorice, no sorry uh, mm. <laughs> um, klaus says why don't they just use a keyboard on a tablet you can design a keyboard with really big letters and let the person type and these are the kind of questions we get all the time it's it's like but but logically, you can just fix this. You can do it. And, and what we're trying to explain to people with these video conversations we're having is that, yes, we hear these questions over and over. And yes, this is still happening. And yes, this is still harmful. And we keep asking why, when a person is capable of pushing buttons and pointing to things, why is it in the air? Why? Why not just let them, here's a keyboard, type to your heart's content. Screen's right there. Go for it. Yeah, I'm going to go make cookies you, and eat licorice. I'll come back and read what you've written, honey. Right. Have a great time. What do you, why do I need to be here to hold this thing in the air for you to point at? That's one of the questions. There's several others. Go ahead and answer that one. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Go. You want to read the question because you're going to lose them, right? Yeah. yeah. Steve Exon. So there's a movie about controversial facilitating communications in the 1980s here in Australia. It's called Annie's Coming Out. Yeah. We're about to lose that one. Hold on, next one. Carmen says, so do they have themselves convinced it works or do they think they're getting away with scamming people? And then Deborah says, facilitators are attention seeking by puppeting the individual disabilities. Oh yes, Vermont, one of the men in winches and jabbers was even videotaped having a meltdown and this is respectful, how? And Klaus says, in all caps, because it doesn't work then, she's. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if, if I could be drinking <laughs> through the coronavirus and what's going on in the government and then Watching videos like this, I'm just putting on weight. That's all I'm doing. Chocolate, <laughs> popcorn, and red liquid. So there's a there's a study that just came out, um, and the 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 reason for the study was to show that um, eye tracking or the 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 proponent said the reason for the video was to show that eye tracking um, that people using assisted communication could eye track they could use this technology and they could they could um identify letters and stuff so there's nothing wrong with eye tracking in and of itself there's actually like i said before there's actually equipment where you put it on and you the the client looks at the keyboard and it, it they interact with each other and they can it's slow but they can they can type out individual letters and words and things they use rapid prompting method as their assisted technology and so during the th and they they actually showed like videos and stuff and and they they have the person looking at the the letters and they actually have them um the facilitator the facilitator is reading a paragraph asking the questions, holding the letter board, and then writing down the responses, right? And so <laughs> no blind, no blinding, no, um, uh, they're, they're, they wanted, 
they, they, no controls because they wanted to show what they do every day in this, this um, center that, that they use facilitated communication with. And um, we asked them, we'd, I'm on a, a team that, kind of, that wrote a, a critique of the, of the study. And we asked them, you know, why, why don't you just use the keeper? Why, don't, why, does the, why is the facilitator there? You know about these queuing problems that are, you know, because it's somebody that no, should know better. Um, and um, they said, well, because that's how we do it. They wouldn't get into a discussion about why, why do you have to even have a facilitator? You can just use the technology mm -hmm. like it's available and and they wanted to track to, to make sure that the person was actually looking at the letters and but the same issues came up the 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 facilitators moving that board in the air and so whether the whether the person could spell or not there's some there's some question about that but um the if the facilitator is holding the board and it's moving then you you can't the eye tracking is not reliable because the board is moving. And so there's all kinds of problems with the study. And we, we tried to, we tried to get into a conversation with them and they said, no, that's just the way we do it. So I can't answer the question about why they don't just use a keyboard. I think, I think um, Ross's answer is the right one because then it wouldn't work. Right. Right. Yes. And they said, they said it wouldn't be assisted te um, technology. It, it wouldn't be assisted communication if we, if we put the board on the on the table and let just let them do it they they're so they're so um focused on proving that it's assisted communication the kind that they use that works that they're not willing to look at anything else but it's supposed to be they're supposed to be the goal of facilitating communication is to start out assisting them and slowly um leave you know the right, they, yeah they call it, it fading. fading out which doesn't happen it doesn't happen because the the in order to make FC work, you have to have the facilitator there to cue. You can't. They they have faded to the shoulder, and they'll say, "Oh, we can." There's no way that we can influence the typing. But we've seen videos where you can. The the parent is is communicating with the and, and they're moving their fingers, and so the 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 son shifts his body over to the left side of the keyboard or the right side of the keyboard and if you've done that kind of training and these people are like have been doing this for a really long time day in and day out this kind of training you can have just the slightest cue and and it's going to affect what letter is pressed you can't and the other thing is there's studies that show that you can't um you can't help it they they um daniel wagner set up a study called uncontrolled intelligences with facilitated communication and they they tried to get the facilitator to think of the wrong answer mm -hmm. with, with the word you know like we i think we we talked about it's like that test you showed me susan where the um the the color oh, the word is the word is orange but it says green mm -hmm. and and so you you if you know the answer or think you know the answer you you're gonna go for you're gonna go for the right answer. So there's no way the facilitator can't control it. You have it's just the way your brain works. I've got I've got a visual of that real quick, and I'm gonna show it to everybody because this is something I think is really important. And I'd like to do a talk, uh, have one of our conversations just with um, oh all these different kinds of things: the idiomotor motor effect, cl clever hands. But you can see here is if you try to read these out. The red, you're seeing the color green, blue is in red, and it's really hard for you to, I guess, I guess they do this in tests to see how fast you can do that. If you can red, purple, black, and try to try to not see the color and and uh, people trip themselves up on it. If that makes any sense to anybody out there. Yeah. So Daniel Wagner's study is not exactly like that, but that's the kind of that that's the kind of um um, things they were testing and they also found out that you don't have to just the way the study it was set up in like five different segments and they, you don't have to be a fanatic for this to to work you had to just um, they found out you just have to believe that it could and that increased the chances that it would so if you if you believe that the communication or if you believe the communication from the other person and not you then the chances are that FC is going to work for you um 
Annie's coming out. Uh, that was Rosemary Crosley was the, she's the leader of FC. She's the one that discovered it. Mm -hmm. And um, Annie's coming out was a book that she wrote with the person that she facilitated with most. Annie was somebody that she ended up um, being the caregiver for. Cerebral palsy also, right? I believe she had cerebral palsy. Yeah. I, so, yeah right, um, riches and jobbers. We're going to have to talk about that. Yeah, that's another movie. Um, Wretches, about, yeah. Wretches and Jabbers is a movie that was made quite a while ago, but it's it's um, it features two adult men with um, different. I think I don't know if they both have autism, but they have um, cognitive difficulties, and they are being facilitated by two of the stars of facilitated communication and who are still working in Vermont, which is, is one part of the reason why I believe that Vermont is such a hard nut to crack because they, they, they're so involved with the community and it's been an open practice for about 30 years. So in a way, like how are these institutions uh, gonna say, oops, you know, we, all these years we, we've uh, been- Sorry, uh, that just doesn't ignore work, what we, so. we said. Uh, yeah, so wretches and wretches and jabber. Money back. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, they use they're using in Vermont. They're using FC in some of the designated agencies for counseling sessions, which I personally think is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so going back to the uh, uh, Rosemary's Rosemary Crosley. Uh, yeah, and the the video that the the work that happened that was back in the nineteen eighties, and that's. One of the things we talk about is that this was discredited 30, 40, 50 years ago. Denmark, Denmark had some studies in um, the 1970s and they, they um, including an abuse case, and they, they ended up stopping, facilitate, banning it, facilitated communication. Mm -hmm. It jumped, it, there was a, um, it was in one of the skeptical inquirer articles recently uh, about Nobel, I forgot what the name of the, the oh, title Oh, yeah, the article was Nobel, um, people who have Nobels, but actually believe- Nobel disease, things. I think yeah. they called it or something. Well, anyway, um, there was a Nobel Prize winner that um, had a son uh, or child with disabilities and was using facilitated communication. And they sort of um, <clears throat> got it going. It's like a virus in some ways. They got it going again, and Rosemary Crosley um, was involved with that in, in, you know, around that same time. And um, she, the, there's an article called um, Communication Unbound by Douglas Bickland that came out in 1990. And they talk about um, the, the, um, the links to the Ouija board in there and they just kind of dismiss it. And, and when I looked at that later, um, like years later, I was like curious about, okay, Ouija board, idiomotor response, when did they all know about that? And I looked it up and it's like 1850. <laughs> so if there was any, you know, if there was any doubt whether they could have not known, you know, or not been able to get research into the idiomotor response, um, which is, which is, you know, one of the factors that makes FC work just like a Ouija board or dowsing, mm -hmm. um, then, they should have done their due diligence. Yeah. Well, like I said before, if it was done pre-internet, I can kind of understand why they wouldn't understand. But you know, once once we got into this, even to the 2010s, uh, it, it's just a click away. All the information that they need to know. It's not. It's not but hard. If you had, if 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 you had this thing that you thought was going to save the world, you know, the change the face of autism. And somebody said, well, okay, maybe, but we're noticing that there's, there's a um, really familiar thing going on here. And we, we're wondering about the idiomotor response. And wouldn't you, as a, as a responsible uh, researcher, say, oh, we better look at that and make sure. I mean, that's what they did in the OD Hex Center. That was the that was the first double blind testing. They'd been, their facilitators had been trained at Syracuse University. They'd used it in their in their center for autism, and they 
um, were getting success and then somebody, the psychologist there said, mm, we better double check and make sure, uh, just just to be sure, you know, like we're, we're okay with it work, you know, like that's great, we just, but we just wanna make sure. And they, they, none of their, none of the answers were based on what the people with autism saw, they, it was all based on what facilitators saw in all answers. They were, they were no, I mean, the correct answers would be what people with disabilities saw, right? There were no zero answers. And and they stopped, you know, they were like, ooh, you know, look, this is bad, sorry, we're, you know, then, uh, you know, we're not gonna do this anymore. And And if you went to the workshops around that time, which I did, they were saying, well, there's going to be some bad press that's coming out. Don't listen to it. And you know, the first that thing you should do is look at the bad press when somebody tells you there's bad press, or don't tell people what we're talking about, what we're doing here. We don't call yeah. it facilitated communication anymore. It's different. Or, of course, you're yeah. going to look it up. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's a miracle. There's got to be something wrong. The um, Deborah has written that she was talking about the wabbers and jabbers. Wait, was it? What does it mean? The wretches and jabbers. Yeah, wreckers and jabbers. She says these, both of these men have spoken language, and yet they're facilitating for them, which is really strange. That's uh, bizarre. Yeah, you can speak, you can point, you can pick things up. They do art. One's they a painter, art. yeah. Yeah, One's they a make art. They, they know to take the paintbrush and stick it in here and do this thing. I mean, they, they know all that. So why are you facilitating for them? Yeah, it's a great know. TV can... show that they travel around the world and they show everybody, hey, hey, Japan, look, we're taking these two guys and this is amazing. And everybody's, oh, fantastic, fantastic. You're, as Deborah here wrote, the savior effect. Look at how amazing what you are doing for these people. Let's go, let's go to Egypt and let's go to England and take these people with us. And it's a TV show and aren't we amazing? And thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying so hard to, to, uh, you know. The, the unfortunate thing about FC is that it, it sort of caught the wave of the inclusion movement and, and um, there was a, there, uh, people with severe disabilities really do legitimately have a beef about how they were treated and, and still are in some ways. And, and I think that's kind of, um, there's like, this much of a grain of truth in what they're trying to do and um and i think it sort of fed that all of a sudden people with disabilities um had a the claim is that people with disabilities all of a sudden had a voice <clears throat> and that's really powerful mm -hmm. i i just read a, a book um and i can't remember the title it's some long thing um <laughs> about was about spiritualism and um and um um, psychic readings and that kind of stuff and and they some of the one of the arguments in the book was that some of the it was mostly women um, that got involved in this and all of a sudden in a time when they were pretty much oppressed they had a voice and they could say because they were speaking as a spirit they could say whatever the heck they wanted to they could and rat out their neighbors and talk about yeah oh he's sleeping with his you know his uh, um the au pair <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah and i think that's, that's where just called me i didn't have to know that yeah and i think that's true of facilitated communication too i think that a lot if you look at the messages that are the books that are out and the poetry and the, even the movies and stuff there's always this theme about um uh releasing the person that's inside freedom um disability rights civil rights all of those are 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 really strong themes that go through fc messages and and i think that that's also another um reason why it it stays around it doesn't doesn't die off because it's giving voice to people who otherwise uh, meaning the facilitators who otherwise wouldn't be able to express those thoughts and and i don't know i that um uh not all of it is conscious on the the facilitators part I, but i do think that it's situational so if you're if you're in a situation where um you're talking if you're in like a just a simple example if you're in a cafeteria and you're you're you know all of a sudden they can they can order the the right you know the food that they want right um but if you're in a situation where you're in a parent teacher conference you know or you're you're 
some of these parents are really active in the in the the disabilities community so all of a sudden you know you're on stage and then so all of these things the the messages that are coming out are you just sort of primed by your environment i don't know if that makes any sense but um it, it does give a it does give a voice to that you know that goes back to my point i guess and and somebody asked whether um it's a scam or if people are really convinced that it works and i think that it's a little bit of both i think there's a there's an element of they convince themselves that it does work and you stop like i moved the person's hand that time but i won't next time and and you think that's enough to correct the error in the in the technique so there's little little things that you tell yourself to convince yourself that it's working and then if you've if you've got um time and money invested in this um technique then you're even going to believe it even deeper and the so i think there's a there's a uh what do we call we had a term for it um like a a willful ignorance i think is what we were talking about um in terms of really looking at the evidence and and really admitting to yourself uh, it, it is it is hard really really hard to say like i was the one that was doing even if it, like in my case there were no. there, it, it got really a bad it, it it got bad in my case but even if you're just saying the sky is blue and you know like everything is lovely that is still the facilitator and it is so hard because it means that you're you face this loss of what you thought was true you know even though it was all built on faults communications you're still you know like you you're the hope was that you'd connect with this person and that person trusted you and that that you know you're freeing that person and all of a sudden if that if you're if you're faced with the reality of you know it's all the facilitator then that that is fucking hard i'm yeah. sorry it's just super hard so heather has has uh, here i'm interested in what you're going to say with this comment that heather has said who's out in the park practicing social distancing with her mask on. <laughs> My friend who has an autistic child says, fortunately no one has tried this with Sam and I know it's all bunk. He primarily uses PECS now and makes any yep. selections himself. His teachers use what is called hand over hand, which is a red flag to me, in terms of him learning to form letters, but never as any mean of communication. What do you think of that? Okay, that's. I think that's legitimate. I, PEX, P E C S, is a picture exchange system, mm -hmm. and so you start. You might start out really simple with a picture of a, a cup and a sandwich and a um, pencil, or whatever. Or I don't know, whatever your favorite toy, and so the person has the ability to pick out if they're thirsty, pick out the cup, give you the cup, and so they're making that. That's an. That's an they call it an exchange. So they, they're learning that if I give you this picture of the cup, you're going to give me something to drink. And so it's a, it's a legitimate, that's a legitimate language system. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, I think it's, it's tends to be manual. So you have, um, cards maybe in a little book or, you know, on, on a board where you have Velcro or whatever and um you know so it can get it can be really simple or and and it gets um as as those exchanges are successful then um it can get more complicated it can actually get quite complicated you learn language structure and all that so that that's um that's an evidence-based method that's one of them and um hand over hand is a technique that this is where it gets a little confusing that that um the physical contact between the the assistant or a facilitate technically a facilitator as well happens while they're learning how to do write the letter or or interact with the communication device or whatever but then the person the the assistant steps back and the the person with disabilities has to perform that same action all by themselves so it's not the it's not the the physical contact necessarily that's bad. It's how long the facilitator 
um, stays and how much control they have over the actual interaction. At some point, with evidence-based techniques, at some point the facilitator steps back or the assistant steps back and the person with disabilities um, performs that action independently. So if, if they left the room, they could still do it. They could still interact. They could still write the letters. They could still interact with the, the communication device. They could still pick out pictures, even if the facilitator wasn't there. But with facilitated communication, if you take the, the facilitator out of the equation, they can't perform those tasks at the same level. Is isn't that hand over hand, isn't that one of the but it's also for facility facil that's one of yeah. their 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 uh, ways they explain what they're doing yeah so, that, so that's, that's a red flag to me when i heard that on my hand over right hand. Oh, right so you have to really you know i just had a conversation with um some people some speech pathologists about um using a letter board just a, a photocopied letter board and they they put forward a pretty convincing argument to use a, a letter board but like, for example, if you're, if you've um, had a, uh, if you have a breathing tube in or you had a trachea, tracheotomy or whatever, and temporarily need to be able to communicate, then you're given a, a letter board and you can type out letters on the letter board. But um, so uh, there was another person that was working with um, a, a client who was homeless. And so having technology would have actually put them in danger of getting, you know, robbed and somebody taking the tech, you know, whatever, whether it was a, a phone or the technology. So there are legitimate uses for a letter board, but you really have to look at the facilitator. How long are they holding that person's hand? Is it always, or is it just, uh, just in a training period? Mm -hmm. Even if the training period lasted a couple weeks, you know, at some point that, that person actually does fade they drop out of the interaction and the person can do it all by themselves so it, that's why i keep saying you know more and more we have to and the technology is getting uh, it's getting trickier and trickier to know who's actually using the communication board so you really have to focus in on the person on the on the facilitator or the assistant um, so cuz there is a, the, it does get it does get confusing you have to you have to um parse that out you know and it's the facilitator behavior that makes all the difference if the person is able to do it on their own like truly on their own like the uh, proponents will say this communication is independent but they mean independent with the facilitator standing there queuing them they don't, <laughs> that's what they mean yeah and so, but, and it's, if you look at the literature, it's all through the literature. Oh, they were doing it independently with support at the wrist, you know, or they were doing it independently, but I was holding the keyboard. In the air? In the air. And so, yeah, right. So, so yeah, I mean, the, like, yeah. So I hope that answers those questions. Uh, Deborah um, says, and with PECS, many generalize across people and settings. Yeah, so you can use the so um, with a with facilitated communication, they generally can only facilitate with one or two people, but with picture exchange system, they can communicate with their friends, they can communicate with family members, they can communicate with the teachers. It's it's um, it's it's a broad it's a broad, but then we've had, I've I've read stuff um, even Rosemary Crosley's early work the there was this question about why wouldn't it work with some people and not others. And they were, um, one of her star pupils was this guy named Jonathan. And he, he didn't, he didn't ever communicate with his mom and never worked on his mom with when it was, so he, she, she, to me, because they were saying, you know, FC only works with people you trust. So they're saying that that boy did not trust his own mother and she died not being able to communicate with him because they were using FC and it didn't work for her. So how, that sucks. I mean, to me, that's a really horrible example. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I wanted to uh, mention to anybody who's watching as we're getting closer to uh, an hour and a half or after an hour and a half, time goes so fast. When yes. Janice and I start talking about this subject, we really both um, ha have a passion for. It. And um, we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna be doing some videos in the future on, 
idiomotor effect and clever Hans. We have got to get into the, uh, let me look at my notes here. We have got to get into more of these uh, harm. And I know we keep saying we're going to talk about harm and we keep putting it into the, uh, to the things we're talking about right now. I'm sure in, if we were to go back and listen to this, this interview, uh, this conversation again, we'll see there's a lot of harm that we're talking about. I'd like to sit down with Mark Edward and have him talk about the Ouija board effect. And he did a brain games show where they put people in. And uh, I think that would be interesting. So some of the other things we want to do is uh, I, I really want to talk about dating and FC. Um, <laughs> we can do that with the harms one. Yeah, I guess so. Um, the Ouija board effect, the idiomotor effect, uh, and then we have other people we're going to talk to. So we're going to have um, um, Craig Foster is going to talk. We're going to do a talk with him, and he, we're going to talk about DJ because he he's written about it. And uh, wrenches and jabbers would be a really interesting talk to be able to do as well on there. I wanted to tell like a really quick story and see if it's relevant. Hopefully, so. Um, I was thinking, I saw one of those more, you know, those, these morning TV shows things are really notorious for putting these kinds of, they put up psychics, they put up just all kinds of pseudoscience. Feel good stories. Yeah, they're feel good stories and it's just really bad. You know, they put it in, everybody's like, oh, that's amazing. I, I once watched one, my favorite TV show, I can't even remember what it was now, but I'd get up in the morning, I'd watch it when I, and you start to feel like you have a relationship with the, the hosts on the TV. And uh, they had a woman come in who did lipstick reading. They would take the lipstick and that she would, me. no, it wasn't you. They take the lipstick, they you know, she would, she would twist the cap and she, and the lipstick would pull up and she would read the person's personality based on the form of the lipstick that was in the, in the tube. <laughs> okay. Seriously. And she had two ho women hosts in there and she was reading it. But anyway, so another one that, and I, I think that was when I finally said, I'm done with this TV show. I think it was CBS this morning or something, yeah. but there was another one where they interviewed a woman whose parrot could communicate color. And what she would do is she would tell the parrot in the cage, she had like four different rings of color, like a blue ring, a yellow ring, a red ring. I think I saw and, this. Uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised because it sounds really amazing. But she would tell the parrot, um, like, Polly, could you give me the red ring? And the parrot would go over and he'd pick up the red ring in his little beak and bring it back, okay? Well, if it didn't get the right <laughs> color, well, the ch chances are one in four, obviously, right there, right? If it didn't get the right color, then the then the owner would say he was just messing with me. Oh. Don't be silly. They say that with FC too. That's, that's what I was. That's where I was going with this. Oh, is that that is even if you're wrong, you're right. So yes. so you make an excuse for them. So the parrot would you know would pick up one in four, bring it over to the to to the owner and get a treat, I guess. And even if it was wrong, uh -huh. they would she would say, well. He usually gets it right, and he's just messing with me this morning. He's mad at me because I went to bed early and I put the cover on his cage early. Or he didn't get to watch Jeopardy with me last night, so he's probably mad at me today. Or he doesn't like the new food he has, so he's... It was just endless, endless excuses. And I really believe that this woman believed it. Um, not only was she getting a parrot that was amazing and she's on TV and getting all this attention and, and, and amazing, you know, for somebody who's really wants some attention like that, which of course you want it because otherwise why would you bring it to people's attention and, and agree to be on a TV show, uh, you know, morning news show, if you really didn't want to have any attention to you. So that's interesting. Cause I only saw, I only saw the clip. So oh, when they were, when they were, the clip that I saw was that she was successful every time. So they edited that. Oh, yeah. to, and that's what they do. All with the, the magic the happens. Well. And Mark is always talking about that. The floor of the, all the, the things that you really want to see are on the floor of the, yeah. uh, the, uh, the editing room. Of course, we don't have editing room floors where it has footage on the floor anymore. But the, but the idea is, is that these are carefully edited. The real magic happens in that editing room. Um, Deborah said that Stubblefield's, Stubblefield's victim's family, FC didn't work for them. No, that's um, Stubblefield, and, and we'll do, we'll, that I have, that's partly, I need to, I need to read up on some of these. That's going to have to be a little. Bit my facts right. But 
um, Anna Stubblefield was a uh, Rutgers University instructor who was yeah, I remember um, hired to work with uh, this person with disability, like profound disability, right? Yeah, that's another. That's DJ. initials they gave him. Yeah, different person. Yeah, different, different than the Deej movie, um, but <clears throat> she ended up um, using facilitated communication to um, gain um, consent for sex. She was convinced that she loved him, and she actually was convicted of two counts of um, sexual assault. So yeah, that was that was a crazy. That's where it's going. Um, there we're seeing more and more facilitator crimes um, the, for the majority of FC, including with the FC leadership, there were um, false allegations of abuse and that's bad enough. And now over the last five or six years or so, we're seeing um, facilitators committing crimes. Uh, and it was on, okay with the person that they were with because the, the disabled person, because they said it was okay, yes. using facilitated communication to say it was okay. Yeah. So, but as she was saying, as Deborah is saying, is that when CJ's family tried to, um, his mom and his brother tried to communicate with oh, CJ oh, okay. yeah. and using FC, it wouldn't work for them. I see. It only I worked see. for Anna Stubble, Stubblefield, the I see, facilitator. I see. She was able to communicate with them through facilitated communication, but the family couldn't communicate with them. In fact, they knew it was BS. Uh, I think Anna Subblefield went to the family and said, CJ and I are in love. I mean, and we're going to have a relationship together and I hope you guys are all okay with that, but he loves me and I love him. And they're like, this is after oh, that is so BS. Him. You are full of it. This, no, there is no way that my little brother, I think it was the brother, he says, there's no way yeah. that my brother could possibly know what love is, let alone even the basics of of having a relationship he was he was um uh, he was like a mentality of a toddler i think is what they were saying he was just not he had some he had some guttural sounds he could make his needs known but he didn't have any he didn't have much functional language i don't i to be honest i haven't read a great deal about it it really disturbs me just yeah. as a, as somebody Coming back to me now as i remember the story it was in, yeah you just and talk about harm and um and see what well, see what happens is in the media is that the feel good stories get picked up and then once in a while these really horrible cases will will show up and and um <clears throat> then FC will get a little bit of press you know every few years uh, this happens and um and everybody will be up in arms for a few minutes and then they go on their way but and 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 so what the FC community says, well, these are just a few bad apples um, that did, although they stick up for Anna Stubblefield for some odd reason. I'm not really sure why. She was an but instructor, wasn't she? Like she high up in Yeah, she was an ethics instructor. She's an ethics, ethics, ethics instructor. <laughs> instructor. <laughs> I can't talk yeah. to me. I need more licorice. <laughs> more chocolate. Yeah. Very so I mean, that, that's the other problem that we're, we're finding is that in order to, um, stop fc there's so many people that uh, that we're finding that still don't know that it still exists even if they knew about it before they're like really surprised and we need to find a way to get the criticism into the press in a way that um that is consistent and 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 noisy uh, because otherwise what happens is the general public will say oh that's a bad facilitator they'll buy into that really quickly and then, uh, in fact, they use me as an example of a bad facilitator. And um, bad girl, bad girl. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, they couldn't. Well, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. Um, and so it, it fades from people's memory, and they they're like, oh, that's only a bad situation. But look, we just see that they they generally, if you, I haven't. This is anecdotal. I haven't I, sh I haven't tracked it exactly, but what I've kind of noticed through the years is that if there's really bad press, and then boom, 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 right in a row, there's this, these really good feel good stories that come out, you know, and usually um, a movie or a, a book or you know that gets a lot of attention or whatever. So so that mitigates this one bad apple that that 
caused abuse or what or false allegations or whatever and then then people move on so we need to as a group i think we need to really think about how do we pressure universities to stop teaching this and how do we get the general public up to speed about care yeah i mean well they don't know what to do and we're going to have a video talking about what we can do what we're trying to do what other people can do to help but it i think again it goes back to the same thing that we hear constantly i don't believe that it still exists there's no way that this still exists because this is debunked 30 or 40 years ago and well so they do it once in a while there's no harm in it and that's what we hear and that's always what we hear and and there's a lot of money in this the people yep. who are um uh who are funding it mainly are parents who have um, a lot of money and are funding it because their child is using facilitated communication and so there's tons of money and again like you said what academic association wants to be i mean uh university of northern iowa when we went after them to stop their workshop that they were doing on facilitated communication on their campus it took a, a, a huge effort to get them to 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 say oh well maybe we won't do it next year first they tell us tell us oh we're going to go ahead and do it this summer but we we might skip it the next summer and we kept hitting them over and over and we'll talk about how we did that um in another video but they eventually said okay maybe we'll cancel it this year or maybe we'll you know it was we'll move it off campus so it won't be associated with our university at a certain point after you've done this year after year after year and you've been hammered by critics who are saying this is incorrect this is just this, this is wrong this is discredited you are now on notice that you are supporting this pseudoscience that is harmful it's hard to turn face and say yeah you're probably right I guess they never more. they never admitted that they said it was an outside agency and they were just renting the space well they don't what they didn't say was that they have staff that are are using and promoting facilitated communication that work directly with douglas bicklin who was mm -hmm. the syracuse leader and so they they technically they answered the call in terms of stopping the conference but the conference just moved off campus it still goes on mm -hmm. and their their staff they never came out with a policy opposing facilitated communication which we asked for but they they were like oh no it was just an outside agency to well, the, we, to we, the school, we, we'll way. have to talk about that in depth because that was that was one of our first forays into um activism against facilitated communication and it had i think it, had, it, had, it was successful in a lot of ways if anything yeah. it galvanized us and forced us to uh become a stronger group of people doing a lot of research on this and i mean you yourself you poured into the details of where the money was going and who was involved and it was it was an extraordinary effort that i still think that we haven't fully seen the repercussions yet and i think it will eventually they're gonna to have to stop it's just yeah you know I think, what, I think what i'm encouraged by i get frustrated quite a bit but i also am really <laughs> tell encouraged me about because it <laughs> they're the world of psychics um people <laughs> who, are, who are fighting against fc were were fighting in ones and twos around the country around the world and and now slowly we're developing a network of people that that to to you know certain degrees some more than others but um keep in contact and and swap information and and um if we do a letter writing campaign then generally um there's people who will um sign those letters and stuff and and i think the what what's been fascinating for me personally is that i've been able to speak with linguists and psychologists and and researchers and whatever and and i think the more that all of us skeptics and also um the more of us that talk together with diverse um, backgrounds, the more of a picture we'll see of why this thing has taken hold and, you know, and what we can do about it to move forward. I, I'm really encouraged by that. I'm frustrated that, you know, I, I never knew 30 years ago that I'd still be talking about this stuff. You know, that, that to me is, that's just completely insane. But um, <laughs> here we are. And, so. and that is true. So, all right. So we should probably start ending this. Um, like I said, I could keep on talking to Janice all day, but I am really hungry now. And I have to have something more than licorice. <laughs> so we're probably going to be doing a talk at least once a week 
uh, Janice and I about the same time kind of works out well for us. So make sure you look for it. The, the video will appear on our, our uh, About Time Project YouTube channel. Please subscribe. There is a playlist of three other videos that where we talked to Catherine B B Bell Bells. Yes. And uh, we, we have other conversations that we're going to be doing with other people. We've got a lot planned to do. Plus, I've been doing a lot of conversations in conversation with a lot of very interesting people that are in my friends list that um, uh, please, you know, not only make suggestions to who I might interview, but, you know, if you'll hook me up with uh, arranging it, the time, uh, that would be helpful for me too. I'd love to talk to them. I'm very interested obviously in psychics and Heather has, Heather Henderson has agreed that she will talk to me about Operation Ice Cream Cone, which is one of the stories that one of our operations that is the least talked about. I think it was a huge win. It was so interesting. And um, I really want to get her perspective on the whole thing because she was the subject. And, and we did a phone reading with a, a psychic and it was, I loved it. I absolutely love it. But the other ones overshadow it so much that we don't really talk about it so much. I don't have a lot of talk scheduled for this next week coming up. Sadly, I'm not sure why. Um, I don't think I have hardly anything. Sometimes I'll do two or three of these in a day. And I don't really have anything coming up. So let's get these things scheduled. So people, if you will... Um, find us on uh, about time project i love doing these on facebook live and having you guys contribute as we're talking and asking questions and i can ask them to janice and then we can kind of answer them in real time i think that makes the conversation much more interesting especially as i say a lot of people just didn't know this was a thing or if it was a thing that it was a long time ago or there's no harm in it and so then really watching the videos along with us or having the discussion with us as we go along they're going wait what <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> i mean if you just say to somebody oh yeah there's this person sitting next to a person who cannot communicate and they're holding their hand and they're pointing to things letters on the keyboard oh okay you know it doesn't you don't really get into it but when we get into these things like the sexual abuse um, the death um, uh, you know, a mother who murders her child because of facilitated communication. Uh, just there's there's so much, and um, you know, anything you want to say, Janice, before I just keep talking for another half an hour and go. To no, just thanks, and I really did. I I did really appreciate the the questions, and I think it adds a, a lot of. I I love hearing from other people and what their perspectives are. I've learned a lot through this process, so and in the appreciate having a chance to yeah i, I like knowing what they know or yeah. what they don't know or what they yeah. no it's great and they make the connections themselves into some of this stuff so anyway y'all y'all so follow us on facebook um we're at about time project and janice has a website she's an amazing artist and i'm looking right now across the monitor and i see a beautiful beautiful uh, main collage she's that I have of hers. I absolutely adore it. And I look at it every time and I think of Janice. It's gorgeous, the work she does. She's been doing some great work with, with uh, vases and uh, the collage is very detailed and it's, it's really clever and, and gorgeous. And you guys should check out her website, which is? Pinecone and Sparrow. Pinecone and Sparrow. Yeah. So check out her website and, 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 and look, look it over. There's some great stuff on there. I wish I had a little more room. I keep thinking I'm going to put something. There's some of the red Christmas ones that I just adore. Well, actually, I adore a lot of what you've got on there. You. <laughs> so you guys, check it out and uh, check out our website, which is abouttimeproject.org. And we have a donate button. If you guys would like to donate, it would be great. We, um, are involved in so many things besides these conversations and facilitated communication you know us from our wikipedia work and janice is one of our editors on there as well and all the work we do with the grief vampires as heather was saying who are you going to sting next and <laughs> i have so much more to do oh and don't forget you guys if you if you were here for the beginning of this talk i'm still waiting for a um an email from a psychic right. I contacted right before this started. Let me look really quick and see if she's answered me. I, I, she wanted to do a free reading for me. She's a skeptic herself and a psychic. And she's going to, she wants to give me a full free reading. And um, nope, she hasn't responded. And so I said, sure, Friday at 11 would be great. We'll do it over Zoom and I'm going to record it. In fact, let's do a Facebook Live. That way, if you're super accurate, 
everybody will know and it'll be amazing and we'll make you a star so i'd like to know how how she communicates with people with disabilities and pets and things that would be interesting oh, to know. that would be very interesting she says she can communicate with people in in um, comas yeah that should be fascinating <laughs> anyway y'all Hi, Janice. Thank you so thank much you. for doing this. Yeah. But as usual, I'm really enjoying myself. And uh, thank you guys for joining, joining us on Facebook Live. And we'll see you guys later. Yeah, thanks, everybody.